So glad that you are here this morning. I want to just greet some very special friends who are with us this morning. Pastor Jerry and Jeannie Brunette, all the way from uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. We're so glad that you are with us this morning. Can you please greet them this morning? We are glad that you guys are with us, and, and as the video was just talking about, I mean, and I hope that you've heard, we are having, we are hosting an event called The Moving Experience, and we have partnered with the artists, the musicians, and mental health specialists in our community to come up with an event because we know that there are a lot of people, because of the pandemic, who are hurting mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we thought how if we could just somehow come up with a, some kind of event that would direct people in the direction of healing and hope. And how many of you have been a part of the church where uh, the past few years there was an event called the Stages of the Cross? How many of you have been a part of that? Well, this we've taken that same idea and we decided that we're going to open up an event for the entire community, all those who are watching in the 715 area code, and you just feel like you just need a pick-me-up, you need a, a, a night of encouragement. We want to welcome you to come to this free event, and we are virtually going to walk people through these stages of healing. We're going to, we're going to have a room where there's going to be a display, an experience of art that people are going to come in and just re revisit maybe the shock and loss that they experience during the pandemic event. Maybe it's still happening now. And then they'll move into another room. If you have that map, they put that up on the screen. Move into a, a, a room where there is going to, where there, the art is going to de depict division because we know there's been a lot of division in this past year in our country and it's, it's trickled down into churches and the families. And then there will be another room that we deal with the topic of confusion and awareness and then moving into that place of bitterness and resentment, but then finding a place of acceptance and forgiveness. And then last of all, there will be a room that is targeted for unity, love, and hope. And I'm just so excited that we could partner with the community for an event like this. And we have just determined we are going to meet people. We are going to love people right where they are. And church, yeah, that, yeah, you please respond to that because that's what the church is supposed to do. And I'm asking you this morning if you would be willing to partner with us. And we just need volunteers who will just simply come during those particular times and they would just come and just greet people and just love on people and help them as they're looking for direction as they go to these, these rooms after rooms. And if you would just come and serve, I'm asking you to do that. And I'd, I'd ask you to do this at the end of the service. There is our information center in the back and there will be somebody, Duong, if you'll wave, wave your arm back there, Duong will be there and she will help answer any questions and she will give you information of how you can volunteer for that event. Um, can I just can we just do this? Can we just pray for that event right now? God, we just believe this is of you. And we, we know that you, your Holy Spirit, when we open ourselves up to you, you lead us to healing and to hope. And we want, it, we want this event to be about that for this community, those in the 715. And we just pray that that would happen, that you would just guide us and lead us in all of that, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you to follow along in your sermon notes. I believe you get so much more out of the message when you follow along with these notes. And, and I know that I had talked to you and I said, hey, we're going to start a sermon series talking about our, our mission and, and vision and values. But I, have, I, I, I call this freestyle. Today I'm going to do a little freestyle. I'm not going to be engaged in a sermon series. I'm just kind of deal with a topic that I feel has been heavy on my heart and based on discussions and based on this upcoming event, I felt that it's important that we deal with the topic of depression. Depression. And just, just one year ago, just over a year ago since the COVID lockdowns, and you, you remember all of us, I think, kind of experienced the same thing. I don't know, for me, I thought, I'm kind of open for a couple of days off. This, this, this is kind of nice, all right, if I'm going to be real with you. And then, and then we got into it, and in week number one and week number two, and it just, my wife and I, we joked and said, every day is Saturday. It just seemed like every day was Saturday. And, and we began to see people, and we, we know that people went through a lot of stress during that time. 
We know that people experience things that they never saw coming, a loss of jobs, a disruption in their daily schedule, their daily lives. There was the fear. Where is this gone? Where is this leading? Am I going to get this, this strange disease? Or my children? And, then, and so people really locked down. And I, we re, my wife and I did a lot of walking through our neighborhood, and just nobody would come out and talk to you anymore. Everybody just was in a lockdown. And we know how this, this issue, this pandemic, became polarized and politicized. And, it, and so it caused a lot of stress. They said that 42% of people surveyed by the U.S. Census Bureau in December reported symptoms of anxiety and depression way higher than any other year before. We know that there is a sense of grief that has happened. And grief, we experience grief whenever we've lost something that was significant. And some people felt like they lost their freedoms. Something happened. Something changed in our country. Some people, it was the loss of a job. Maybe it was some of you are here today, and we're glad to have you back. We haven't seen you in a while, and you've been sick because you lost your health, and you're still struggling uh, f- f- with your health. Audrey, I'm so glad to see you here this morning. I, it's good to have you back. And then we, we know that there are some who have lost loved ones and, and unable to have a, a funeral because of the pandemic. So there was loss. And we know that they, they said that the CDC said that there was a, a, an incredible increase of substance abuse that has not only increased for people who were users before, but people who have just started it to cope and deal with their discouragement and depression. And then we know that depression, a lot of people dealt with this. Research shows that more than half of those who got the COVID disease are today going through severe, severe depression. People all around us, just like I talked about in a video, there, there's a lot of people who are walking around with smiley face on the outside, but chaos and pain and hurt on the inside. And even Christians, even Christians, been there, done that. I think all of us can, we can resonate. We've, we've gone through seasons of pain. And hurt, and smiling on the outside, but pain and hurt and not knowing how to deal with it on the inside. And I, I think sometimes there's, a, there's kind of a progression in, in my experience. And as I had an opportunity to work as a year and a half as a, as a, a corporate chaplain and dealing with a lot of counseling with people, I, I would hear kind of the same stories. I would hear people say, I experienced a hurt, something that I never saw coming. A hurt came my way. And that hurt, it turned into a discouragement. And I did not know how to process that discouragement. I didn't know how to get out of that discouragement. And then that discouragement, it evolved into a depression. And I found myself just stuck in pain and just numb and not knowing how to move out of it. And here's the danger. Here's the danger is when that depression, when when it goes undealt with, it can evolve into a place of hopelessness. And that's the danger zone because we know a lot of people make a lot of terrible or rough or discouraging life choices in the land of hopelessness. So today's message, I'm talking about dealing with the pain. And I want you to know, I really wrestled with even giving this a title because I don't want to come across as like, hey, I, just do this and do this and it's all going to go away because I don't know if it always happens like that. But I'll just say this, the Word of God speaks to this issue And so if you'll just allow me to this morning, I just kind of want to tap into this topic and not try to tell you how to make all your problems go away, but hopefully that the Holy Spirit would speak to you this morning because He is the great counselor. He is the great encourager, and He will speak to you this morning. So again, I know this is a, a, a sensitive subject, but let's move forward. And I want you to know that, yes, not only Christians, but even Bible heroes People in the Bible who did great things for God went through periods of depression. And this morning, we're going to look at such a superhero. We're going to look at this prophet named Elijah. And the prophet Elijah, if you read his story, I mean, he, God worked through him to do some pretty awesome things. I mean, this guy, Elijah, after some of the things I'm going to share with you, I mean, he is on the top of his A game. He is high up there, and we're going to read how he evolved and almost immediately, almost overnight, was in the lowest of lows. 
I'm going to talk about him this morning. So the story talks, we're going to read in 1 Kings. This is in the Old Testament, 19, 1 through 16. And the story starts out with a king named Ahab. And he was the king of Israel. The only problem was he was a wicked king. The Bible says he was one of the most wicked kings that, that, that Israel had ever had. And he just, he was so evil, he led people away from, from focusing on God, and he would lead people, and he brought in the prophets of Baal, and they worshiped the, the idol of Baal. Well, one day, one day, everybody just say one day, anybody have one of those days, Ahab had a pretty incredible run-in with Elijah. And God showed up through Elijah, I'm going to talk about that here in a few minutes, but God showed up in this man's life, and really, it put Ahab in his place. And it was a very humiliating day for Ahab, a day of humiliation. Look at 1 Kings 19, 1 and 3. Then Ahab, after this day, he went home and he told his wife, Jezebel, everything that Elijah had done, he was so mean to me. And it included that he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So he just went home, and this, this wicked king, he really had been showed up. And well, well, Jezebel was his wife, and she was just as wicked, if not more wicked, than King Ahab. And she's going to stand up for her husband, who had been humiliated. And again, Ahab is back in the corner, and he's just beside himself. And she writes a letter, sits down and pens a letter to this young Elijah, and she says this. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Now, can you just imagine receiving a letter like this? from the queen. Not just, not, this is maybe a, a king's stamp, but she receives this from a, king, from a queen. He's got mama upset. Mama is coming for him. Now again, God, let's just, let's back up this rewind us here. God had just done some incredible incredible things. If you read the story of Elijah, he did some incredible things through Elijah. There was a drought that was going through the land, and Elijah called out to God, and God had provided for this drought, this, this entrenched rainstorm that came. He, he, Elijah had met a woman who had nothing, nothing, and God told Elijah what to tell her, and her supplies were multiplied before her very eyes. Elijah prayed for her son who had died, and the son had risen from the dead. We're talking about a really good day of ministry going on here, and then there was a showdown. There was a showdown at this place called Mount Carmel, and, and Elijah confronts all the people of Israel and say, listen, why don't we just decide who is the one true God, the God who Jehovah Jehovah God are this, this God that you're serving, this Baal idol. Why don't we just decide? Why don't we declare right here, right now? And he says, this is what we'll do. We'll, just, we'll have a, a sacrifice that is set up right here on this side for Baal, and we'll have a sacrifice set up for Jehovah God. And we'll let you go first. And the God who shows up and ignites the flames to that sacrifice, then we will know who is the one true God. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let you go first. So Elijah just sat there and watched, and all these, uh, these prophets of Baal, and they called out, and they screamed, and they cut their arms, and they did all the things that these people did for their idol worship, and nothing. And all day long, nothing. And they would do a little dance, do a little rain dance or whatever, nothing. Nothing would happen. And Elijah would point it out, he's like, I can't help but notice that nothing is happening. He says, why don't, we, why don't we see what the one true God can do? And he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not only going to, what we're not only God is going to ignite this, but we, let's just make this interesting. And he poured just gallons and gallons of water on top of this sacrifice. Let's just really, let's see if God, so he soaked the wood through, soaked the sacrifice, and he called out to God. And sure enough, God showed up and he consumed the sacrifice. He consumed all of the water. God showed up in a mighty way. Have you ever had one of those days where God showed up in a mighty way? God did a great work through a great man. Now, he gets a letter in the mail that the queen is coming for him. And after all these incredible events, check out what Elijah's response was to Jezebel's threat. Verses 3 and 5, Elijah was afraid. 
and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the, into the wilderness, traveling all day. He is running for his life here. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. It's like, are we talking about the same people here? The same person? Is it, how, how can this be this guy who is just on the top of his A game and God is working in and through his life and then the next day he's running for his life and he just wants to die? Can I just talk about from the story just briefly here, just five things that I pick up on that maybe fueled his depression. First of all, we see that there is the fear of the future. And that's what fear does to us sometimes. Fear, we know, is a natural response to something that is coming our way and we don't know what's going to happen. And it's a natural response. So I, I'm not dissing fear. We all, it's a natural response that happens to all of us. The only problem is here is when we allow our fear, listen to me, when we allow our fear to paralyze our faith. That's where the struggle lies. And many of you are here today and you're watching online and you may be wrestling with fear. And my encouragement is to you, I understand, I understand, I've been there, done that. But I want to encourage you, don't allow the fear of the enemy to paralyze your faith from God. The second thing is that they wore them, he wore himself down. He wore himself down. Elijah had just faith, faced an incredible faith battle that went on here. And now he finds himself running for his life. Why? Because I believe he was mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. He really had come to the end of the road. And many of you are, might here, be here today and you're just you're wiped out. You're tired. Moms, you're out there and you're, you're trying to keep up with, it, with, with what's happening with the school. You're trying to educate your kids. You're trying to keep up with your job, keep the house in order, keep your kids safe. It's a lot going on there. Dads, you're wondering if you're going to have your job tomorrow. And you're working overtime so that you can keep up with the bills. And kids, some of you are just, you, you've lost your whole social network because of this, because you've been been at home, and I, I just feel bad for the, ki- for the kids the most who are, who are missing out on some of them, their, their sporting events and their senior year. It's been tough. And some of you, you're just saying, listen, I just feel worn out. I feel tired. I feel burned out. I remember a few years ago, my parents' health was, was failing around the same time. My, my dad had passed away about seven years ago, and then my mom just shortly after. And I don't know, I just felt like it was my duty, it was my responsibility that I needed to carry the load and I needed to do their funerals. And, and to this day, I don't regret that, okay? I don't regret that. But, it, but I also felt like I needed to be the strong one. And I needed to be strong for everybody. And I noticed and I recognized really uh, there was a depression that was beginning to rise up in me. And I believe it it was in those moments that it was beginning. I took on too much. I took on too much and I tried to be too much for everybody else. And maybe moms, moms are notorious for doing that. Maybe moms, you're just trying to be too much and you can't keep up. Sometimes we shut people out. Notice what Elijah did. What did he do? He went out alone. He told his servant to stay here. And I'll and I tell you, that's what I'm tempted to do sometimes. Just go at it alone. Go at it alone. I, I had a, a pastor friend who a few years ago lost his son to suicide. And, and he just kind of built a wall around himself. And he, he just tried to go at it alone. And finally, he showed up at an event. And, and us brothers, we just gathered around him and just loved on him. And he just broke because we're not meant to carry these things alone. We're not, meant, we're not meant to do our faith journey alone. You need to be in a life group. We need to do our faith together. And then here there was a focus on the negative. Elijah began to feel sorry for himself, and he began to exaggerate the situation, because that's what we do sometimes when we're down. We exa- I don't know about you. You probably don't do that, but I, I tend to exaggerate the situation, and I, I tend to say to myself, it's never going to get any better. There is no hope. And then last of all, sometimes we forget about what God has done. 
Elijah had forgotten all that God had done. I mean, again, he was on the mountaintop, on the mountaintop, and, and how could he have forgotten? You know, I think it's interesting when you read through the story of the Israelites and their, their trans, transition, they're moving forward. We see this one story where God says, listen, before, the, before I close up the river, I want you to go into the river and I want you to gather up these large stones and I want you to build a memorial. And I want that memorial, this is what this memorial is going to do. That memorial is going to remind you of what God did. And when you look at that memorial, you can say to yourself and say to your grandkids or your children, you say, you know what? If he did it then, he can do it again. And I think for some of us, maybe, just maybe, we need to build not an idol, but a memorial maybe in our backyard or that place where we look out our window and we remind ourselves, look what God has done. And by golly, if he can do it then, he can do it again. So listen, we all can fall into that place of depression. I've been there. I've done that. A few years ago, was, I just knew I was coming to an end of, of my place of ministry. And, I, and I th- I th- again, I think it started with my parents' death and a couple things that happened. And I, I just tell people, if you don't deal with things, you will deal with things. You know how I found that out? You know how I know that? Because it happened to me. I wasn't dealing with things. And I found myself a couple mornings early, 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 early in the auditorium of our church, probably rolled up, probably at that corner of the auditorium, just all rolled up, just calling out to God, weeping and not knowing why I was weeping, hurting, exhausted, wiped out, burned out, fried out, you name it. I was there. And I, I was just stuck. And I, it wasn't too long after that that I turned in my resignation to, uh, to be the pastor of that church. I was overwhelmed, and maybe you're in that place today, feeling overwhelmed, stuck. I I don't know how to get out of that depression. You see, the danger lies when we stay there. You see, God, God did not slam Elijah. Elijah was in that place that I just described. He was in that place, and God did not over spiritualize it to Elijah. Elijah, come on, come on. What's the matter with you? Get up, get a do. You know, that's not how God worked. He doesn't tell Elijah, hey, just try this. Go to this therapy. Goes, he doesn't, he doesn't do all those things. No, God instead just meets Elijah right where he is. And my hope and prayer is that God would just meet you right where you're at today. Because our God understands. He knows where you are today. And so this morning, again, I don't have any kind of recipe or anything like that, but I just want to look and see what happened to Elijah here, and just maybe the Holy Spirit would speak to you to maybe what you're going through. And the first thing that I see here is that God challenging Elijah to get up and replenish himself. Like, like this is what it says here, verse 5 and 6. But as Elijah was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. I like angels like that. (laughs) Get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. And so Elijah ate and he drank and he lay down again. I like this story. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. The journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. You see, again, Elijah was exhausted. He was exhausted mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And he needed to be rejuvenated. Have you ever been in that place before? Have you ever noticed how big the problems become when you are exhausted? When you are worn out, when you are wiped out, burned out, how that just may be that small thing in everybody else's eyes has just become a giant in your eyes. Tired and exhausted. And the first thing God tells Elijah, and listen to me, please, I don't, th- this is maybe a tough one to hear, but I just want to encourage you, whatever it means to you, God tells Elijah to get up, to don't stay there. Get up, don't stay there. 
Don't, don't stay down. And whatever it is, whatever it means for you, just keep doing something to keep moving forward. I think God is trying to tell us today, your story, listen to me, your story is not over. There's more battles to be won. God's got plans in store for your life. But you're going to have to get up. You're going to have to get up. And you've got to, you've got to get up. You see, when we're down, when we're down... It's easy to stay down, right? And it takes work. So again, I'm not just saying, just get up, just, you know, it's all brush it off. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. I, I, the, but the easiest thing to do is to stay down. I do know that. It's easy to stay down, and it's tempting to stay down. But God saw what Elijah needed, and he said, listen, I not only want you to get up, but Elijah, I want you to replenish yourself Find that place. Find those things that replenish. And apparently for Elijah, and I'm a lot like Elijah, it might, food might be connected to that. I'm kind of open to that idea. But not only food, but it was some sleep. Again, I believe he was exhausted. He was exhausted. And he needed to recalibrate his, his sleep. How many, again, how many times is the, the issue so much bigger, but we wake up the next day after a good night's sleep and the problem just seems to fade away, or we have a different perspective on it. But then he tells them to eat and drink like a good Italian, right? <laughs> like a good Italian. And, and I ask you this morning, what are you taking in? Could it be could it be that what you are taking in is adding to the depression? Do you know this? They, they have, scientists have shown that when we are depressed, we, have, we crave certain foods that ironically, those certain foods add to the depression. Did you know that? Did you know that? And it's like, ah, oh, I was so bothered when I read that because I just thought that jelly donut would make it all go away, Lord. But I just ask you, maybe the thing you're taking in is adding to it. Maybe it's not food. Maybe some of you are, are struggling because you, you, you never meant for it to be an addiction, but the thing that you're putting into your life to cope with the pain has now become an addiction, has now become a stronghold, and is now only, and, and you, you maybe go through just a little time of feeling reprieve and like, ah, oh, this feels so good, but you wake up feeling that much worse. I, I just ask you this morning, Lord, what are you taking in to replenish yourself? For me, I, 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 I like to listen to books. I, I, like to, I like to listen to podcasts. And in my mornings, here's what I've noticed. I can either turn on the news when I do my workout in the morning, but it just has an effect on me. How many of you discover, I just, I go to wherever I'm going the rest of the day, I'm just frustrated. I'm like, I feel more stressed out after my workout. And, I, and, I, and so I've discovered that, you know, I, I preach on Sundays, I need somebody to preach into my life. And I've been listening to some great preachers, some podcasts. I feel renewed. I feel replenished. Replenished. I go on spiritual walks with God or a spiritual run every morning and I connect with my father and it renews me renews me so maybe the the only major contributor to your depression is you're tired and you have not taken time to replenish yourself let me let me and for some of you are here you're like pastor I just feel guilty for doing that there is so much going on there's so many people in my house I just don't feel right about Taking care of myself over other people. How many of you ever felt that way before? Okay. How many of you have flown on an airplane before? How many of you listened to what the flight attendant told you as they're giving their spiel as they're taxiing to the runway? If you have not listened, one of the things that they talk about is in case we lose a cabin pressure, in case there's no more oxygen left on the plane, there's this little thing that's going to fall down from the ceiling. Okay. And this is what we want you to do. What do they say to do? Put it on your face. Put it on yourself first. And then what do you do? Help the person next to you. And for some of you, you have been so busy going throughout the entire plane putting on everybody's mask that you have no oxygen for yourself. 
and you're burning yourself out. And so I just can't, if I could just be that flight attendant today and give you permission to put on some oxygen yourself. Can I just do that? Can I give you that permission? So God's challenge for the depressed and hurting is get up and replenish yourself. Find a way to take in oxygen, whatever that is for you. Number two, reject the lies with the truth. Reject the lies with it. Sometimes we get stuck in our depression because we've easily fallen for the lies and then we focus on them rather than focusing on the truth. Look at this verse here, verse 9 and 10. There, came, there he came to a cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Well, God very, he really knew what Elijah was doing. He was kind of running from the problem, running from the situation. But he just wanted to hear Elijah talk. And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. Well, this is a true statement. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. Well, that's a true statement. It's a very discouraging statement, but it's true. They have tore down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. Again, a very difficult truth to accept. So far, all these are true statements. But then... Through his depression, the exaggeration comes. And he says, I, I'm the only one left. I'm the only prophet who's doing anything good around here. I am the only one. And now they're trying to kill me too. And that was false. That was not the truth. Again, in his weariness, all that he saw was how alone he felt. But that was not the reality. And that's what the enemy wants to do to us. The enemy wants to bring us to that, that lie that you're all alone. And nobody can understand what you're going through. Not even God. You're all alone in this. And, every, and so Elijah was declaring, everyone is dependent on me. But I want you to know this morning, you are not alone. We need to replace the lies and focus on God's truth. So here's what I challenge you to do this morning. Because sometimes people have bought into the lie, of just like Elijah. I'm the only one, and if I don't do this and I don't do that, as a matter of fact, I've met a lot of pastors who fall into that trap. If I don't do this and I don't do that, then this church is going to fall all apart. It's never going to grow, and I need to do all these things. And what they do, they burn themselves out. But my encouragement to you this morning is that what if we said, listen, from here on out, I'm going to do only, only what I can do, and I'm going to trust God for only what He can do. I'm going to trust God for what He can do. So again, we're talking about God's challenges. Maybe God is speaking to you this morning about moving out of this depression and hurt. And so I would just encourage you, you get up. Come on, get up and, and find a way to replenish yourself. It's okay. And number two, reject the lies that the enemy is trying to throw at you. You are not alone. Number three, I encourage you to listen for God's voice in the midst of a storm. Listen. You see, sometimes in the midst of our depression, that's all we can hear is that inner voice of how bad we have it how difficult that it seems. And, we, and, and so we get away from that position of hearing from God. And I would encourage you, just like, just like God was saying, get up and go listen to God. Find a way to get to God because God wants to speak. And, and sometimes God doesn't always speak. Thus saith the Lord. Sometimes, God, Mario, you've heard God speak before. Did you ever hear God speak before? Was it, Mario, listen to me. Thus saith the Lord, this is what I want you to do. Was it like that? It was just, yes, yeah. It was kind of in this still, small voice. Listen to this encounter that he had, verse 11 through 13. It said, go out. Again, another get up, get up moment. Get out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Listen closely. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And in the midst of all that chaos, in the midst of all that storm, there was the voice of God. And Elijah would have missed it had he not put himself into the position to listen. And I want to challenge you, church, wherever, whatever you're going through, you've got to get up 
And you've got to go and you need to find that place where you can hear the voice of God. And for some of you, maybe it's on your way to work. You just need to turn off the noise. You need to turn off the remote control. You need to just go for a walk. But I would encourage you, get out to where you can hear the voice of God. Psalm tells us, David tells us in Psalm 46.10, he says, be still and know that I am God. You know what the, the paraphrase of that verse is? It's back off. Back off. Stop doing what you're doing. And listen. For some of you, right there, I think that's the key. You just need to stop and listen. Because when we listen, we hear His voice. And He tells us, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. You can. Yes, you can. With God's strength, you can do all things. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So again, God's challenges for the depressed and hurting. Get up and replenish yourself. It's okay. We need to learn to reject the lies with the truth. We need to listen for God in the midst of the storm. And the last word I would just encourage you with this morning is sometimes we just need to get back on mission. You see, sometimes in the midst of our depression, to get us back, God gives us an assignment to accomplish. Listen to what it says here. And I'm going to mess up some words here because I don't speak Hebrew. Then the Lord got, told him, go back. Did you see how many times? Get up, get moving, go to, get back. The same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be the king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, the uh, grandson of Nimishai, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Manola, and to replace you as my prophet. Do you see what he did here? Because what do prophets do? What do prophets do? Prophets go and they anoint. I need, I need you to get back to your mission, Elijah. You need to get back to what you were doing. You need to get back to what you're doing. And some of you are here today and you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I, I, I talked to you about a time that I stepped away from being a pastor, and that was hard. That was the hardest thing I've ever did. And we, we took a season. It took about a year and a half, to, and we began to hear from God, and it really felt like God was calling me to get back. I was doing a great work. I wasn't sure I would ever get back. But I was just praying just in case, and God called us back to that mission. I'm so glad God called us back to that mission. And, it, and something was restored. Something was renewed in me. What is that for you? What is God calling you back to? What is God calling you to do? And if you don't know what that is, if you don't know what that is, I'm going to tell you this. God's plan and purpose for your life, your plan and purpose for your life is that you would join with him in this mission of life change. That's your mission, that, because that's God's mission. He's full throttle on this mission that the church would join him. And so whatever that means for you, and maybe an entry-level position for you just might be the moving experience where you just come to church and you just love people right where they are. No matter how they're dressed, no matter what they look like, no matter how they act, you just love people. You, you want to look for purpose in life? There it is. Then what if you just put yourself in the position to serve others? Maybe you find your healing there. Do you know what they found? Scientists said this. Scientists have discovered one of the cures. Listen to me. One of the cures, that, as they studied depression, one of the cures for depression is to get out, of, get out of your focus of yourselves and put it on helping others. Did you know that? That's a scientific fact. One of the cures for depression is that you would get off your focus on yourself and you would begin to focus on others and serve them. And I don't know what that means for you. I'm, I'm encouraging you to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit this morning. But whatever that means for you, I believe God gives us some direction as I close out this message this morning. I believe for some of you, God is telling you, listen, you got to get up. 
get up. And it's okay for you to put on the oxygen mask for yourself. It's okay to do that. Take care of yourself. Number two, stop listening to the lies and start listening to the truth. For some of us, we just need to turn off the noise and listen for God in the midst of the storm. And for some of you, Maybe it was through the, the, the challenges that Thrive Church has gone through and you put, you put things on pause and you said, no, I'm done. And maybe God is speaking to you, it's time. It, it's time for you to get back on mission. That thing that you, that ministry you were leading or working in before, it's time for you to get back on mission. I encourage you to do that. Maybe you're here this morning, you're watching online and you say, Pastor, I, 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 do, I feel stuck. And I want God to intervene in the midst of this storm that I'm going through. Can I just pray for you this morning? Just, just raise your hand. Just say, Pastor, would you pray for me? All around this room, those who are, on this, who are watching online, I want to pray for you in Jesus' name. God, we just pray that you would just begin. Just as you spoke to Elijah, you would speak to us in that still, small voice. Speak words of life. Speak words of healing. Speak words of hope. In Jesus' name, we, Lord, we pray that we could take just the elements from this story and whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, we would begin to apply to our lives and that healing and hope would arise. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name. And Jesus, healing and hope. Can we give God praise for healing and hope this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I don't know where to begin. It begins with relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where it starts. And maybe you're watching online and you have never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of life. I want to invite you to do that this morning. All you have to do is call out to him. Just right where you're at, just say, God, I need you. I'm inviting the Lord of the universe to come and live inside of me, to forgive me, to renew me, to heal me. I want Jesus in my life. I need Jesus in my life. And I choose today to make him Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that when that happens, our lives change. That the old is gone and the new has come. Can we just give God praise for life change? If you have prayed that prayer for the first time, we have received these, these Bibles. They're called New Believer Bibles. They're New Testaments. And I have personally written out some instructions that I would have you to, to follow through on. And, and, and it's because sometimes you enter into faith and you're like, where do I go from here? It's right here. It's right here. We've made it simple for you. And if you would like to receive one of these Bibles this morning, just go back to the back at the guest center. And, and, and again, we've chosen the nicest people in the entire church. We vetted these people. <laughs> and they're going to help you. They're going to encourage you this morning. Can we just give God a hallelujah this morning? Let's just give him praise. Thank you, Lord. Lord, be glorified in Jesus' name. Hey, this is Sheldon Miles here, pastor at Thrive Church, and I want to thank you for watching this video. And if it impacted you in any way, I want to encourage you to do three things. First, become a part of the Thrive Church family by subscribing and following us. Make sure to join us on our Facebook page every Sunday. Second thing is share. Share with your friends, coworkers, and the people around you. The final thing, consider partnering with us financially. If this ministry is impacting you, I would ask you to pray about what you can give to help us take this message to the entire 715. And as always, we want you to know that you are welcome, accepted, and loved here at Thrive Church. And remember, you were created to thrive. We'll see you next week.